I'm Stacey Higginbotham with GigaOM, and I'm here with De Kevin Roach <laughs> in IBM Spintronics Lab, where you guys are working on what exactly? We are working on the materials for the new technology of Spintronics, and this goes into memory, into storage, and into what we call quantum engineered materials that we hope to create new technologies with. New technologies, and if I'm to sum all this up, I'm trying to figure out like, what we do in here is we build materials that don't exist in nature. Okay. So we can manipulate the quantum properties of solids. The thing we do much work on is manipulating electron spin okay. as a tool to build the technology that uh, we want to create. And why is electron spin so interesting, so important? Well, electron spin, first of all, is where magnetism comes from. Mm -hmm. And we have lots of experience with magnetism from our work in uh, recording technology or storage. Uh, the spin valve head, which is the one that can read read smaller bits, came out of our uh, work just down the hall. Okay. So uh, that was sort of our first big success, and we moved on to using spin techniques to store data in what's called MRAM, mm -hmm. which is an ongoing project, and now we have Racetrack, which goes back to magnetic recording. We use magnetism again to store the data, but now instead of spinning a disk, we can use spin polarized electrons to move the data through a wire. Like a, like a wire recorder, except there are no moving parts. All right, help me visualize this. I'm, I'm trying to picture electrons. I'm trying to picture how this translates okay. to bits. Okay, electrons have spin up and spin down. Mm -hmm. and normally, you have an equal mix of them. But if you polarize them, so you're working with all spin up mm -hmm. or spin down, and if you have a, a magnetic wire, mm -hmm. what we call a nano wire, so smaller than a human hair, you can have a magnetic pattern on that, just like you can have on recording tape, or a magnetic disk. It turns out if you then put current that's all one spin through it, it sweeps the whole pattern down the wire. Okay. And the spacing stays the same. So we can move that pattern of data past a read head or a write head to read it, to modify it, just like we do in a tape recorder, except that there are no moving parts and it, it's microscopic working on nanoscopic size. So our goal is to take a whole bunch of these and put them vertically on a chip that's the same size as the current memory chip. So if we can put 100 bits of data into that racetrack, that's what we call the wire, then without making our transistors any smaller, we now have 100 times as much data on the same chip. Because you're stacking it up. Because we're, we're, the data goes vertically, and the read and write is in the plane just like we already make for memory. Okay. So that's the big push, the big goal for racetrack. And racetrack is how far out from a timeline perspective? When we... We're, we've done proof of concept mm -hmm. uh, two years ago. I remember. I you wrote about that. And we're working on optimizing how much current it takes to move the wire. Okay, so. Or you know, move the data through the wire. And to be honest, I'm not sure how close we are. We haven't hit any, um, any, any killer roadblocks yet. Mm -hmm. And we're working on optimizing the materials for the wire and the process to actually make that vertical wire when the rest of the chip is horizontal. And we, we have some techniques for doing that. This machine is one of the tools for playing with the materials mm -hmm. that we need to make it happen. So this machine, and we'll get back to that in a second, but okay. this machine does what? This is a thin film deposition system. Mm -hmm. So we, we make coatings. So we put a very clean surface in there, a silicon wafer mm -hmm. or something else, and each of the chambers, each of the large cans in the chamber can produce a plume of mm -hmm. materials. That's a jet of atoms and clumps of atoms, and it's just like spray painting. Right. If we put a clean surface in it, that plume comes up, it coats it, just like spray paint. And you have different layers coming out from... Well, we move the wafer to okay. different positions, so it's like different colors of paint that we're layering. And so, yeah, or a layer cake. So you can have different kinds of filling, different different flavors of, of layer, and so that some total tastes very different than any one of the layers in the cake we taste. So this, now the process of building up the layers, though, is not the same, that is for one, that is not, will you stack those? Will you create several wafers and then stack them? Or is this the whole process of this creating is, the stack? We, um, we create a stack of materials on one wafer, mm -hmm. and then we take it and cut away the parts we don't want right. to make a device. So then, uh, and this is very similar to how ICs are made, how mm -hmm. chips are made. The actual core of it is, what, is a multi-layer like this. Built up We're, and then etched away. What? It's built up and then etched away. It's built up and then etched away, or, uh, well, it's etched one way or another, either right. with acids or with electron beams or 
or any of a number of techniques. We have some simple tricks we can do here with masks, just like stenciling spray paint. We can actually put a mask in front of the beam and put down a simple pattern on our wafer. So we can do some very simple devices right on the fly without having to do a step afterwards. Many of our processes in this machine use high temperatures and the masks don't work at high temperatures. Mm -hmm. They tend to curl up and cut through the layers we're growing. So okay. we, um, whereas we used to do many things with masking in our older lab, they were doing much more where we do whole wafer and then etch it away as we describe it. Okay. So back to the timeline. Okay. Or back to the idea of commercialization. You're working, what are the things that you're working on or what are the things that need to be commercialized? I don't know if they're... We are one step before commercialization. Okay. What we're trying to do is, is do the science and create the technology all in one shot. So to do simple devices, so we've proved we can move the data, and now mm -hmm. we have to move it better, move it faster and uh, with less current, less power. Because okay. power is one of the things that we're very aware of. Right. And that's why we want, that's why we like spintronics. The key is that current electronic semiconductors move charge, mm -hmm. whereas spin is independent of charge. And what we've learned is by moving a little charge, we can unlock access to lots of spin. Right, it's like setting off a domino reaction. Kind of, Except exactly. the dominoes would keep the same pattern. Right, so what we want to be able to do is, is save all that power. We just, mm -hmm. just enough current to unlock things, and then we can use the electron spin for logic right. and for storage. We're going for this storage class memory, the racetrack, mm -hmm. first, because we understand magnetic recording. We've been doing it for so long. But some of our other more exotic experiments in this lab are looking at more fundamental things that use the spin more directly than just as a way to push the uh, magnetism around. So can you help me understand either from a power like perspective, like how much power it takes? Is it an astronomical amount compared to existing? And then can you also tell me right now where you are at the amount of data? Is it what would fit on like a, a five and a half or five and a quarter inch floppy? I'm just, is, um, is there any comp, can you I make those? I actually don't compared? know those numbers. Okay for where we are right now. Okay. My job is to make this thing work. That's, uh, um, I write the software, I design the control interfaces for this machine. We have a group of about 20 people, and this is set up so with four active chambers, four or five people can be running experiments simultaneously, and my software swaps the wafers around as they need to to move nice. from one chamber to the next, so. All right, any, what else are you working on or anything else you want to tell me about while we're here? Well, uh, as I said, we, we still occasionally get calls about uh, heads. There's still okay. a little bit of head design that goes on, and sometimes we will run an experiment either in this machine or one of our other uh, labs to, to get data that lets them optimize what they're doing better. We have the MRAM project, which we were was a main focus of our work for many years, and that is still going on, um, the efforts to optimize it. Yeah, that I was like, MRAM is kind of out of the commercialization stage, but it's still not in production. I, I there's a there's some tricks that we need to do to make it faster, and that's what we're working on. What are those tricks? I can't talk about. Okay. That. And uh, the but that is one of the things that we are still involved in because okay. we did all the groundwork on that. And then racetrack, we're working on some exotic oxides in this lab where we uh, can tune their behavior so they go from being an insulator to acting like a metal back to being an insulator okay. according to what we do to them and we're thinking uh, those might have applications for interfaces for touch screens or that sort of thing something uh, that would be cool and uh, we're involved in the synapse project which is to try and build a hardware a piece of hardware that behaves like an actual neuron uh, synapse which is going to be super cool. But let's go back to storage real fast, okay. because we, we need that today. Um, let's talk about the intersection of storage and memory, and what is driving that today in terms of compute demand, in terms of all the things that are happening with like cloud computing, web services, I mean, just everything. Right. Uh, it, the boundary comes down to cost versus speed. Mm -hmm. Disks are cheap. You can store lots of data on them, but it takes a while to get the data off of them. Mm -hmm plus they're mechanical, so they consume lots of power and they break down mechanically. So we're trying to get into that middle region where we can't quite store as much data as we get on a disk, but we can get lots of data that's accessible very quickly and with no moving parts and at low power. And we think Racetrack is a very good candidate to, to fill that niche. Uh, we're not the only people looking at it. You mentioned mm -hmm. phase change. That's another 
technique people are looking at for getting into what's called storage class memory. Right. But uh, but our contender is is racetrack, and uh, we started out with a five-year plan, five-year goal, and uh, so far we're pretty much on track for that. Okay. Uh, from once we had the the lab seriously up and running, so we're looking at we hope near future, not immediate future, but near future. Like three years Something would be like that, that time frame. It's I won't I won't I won't call you in three years and be like, where is it? Right. Um, but this would be used in data centers perhaps where like flash like SSDs are now this is the end goal or would it also be I mean flash is used in my digital camera and my alarm clock even. Uh, uh, Stuart Dr. Parkin talks about what he calls his PLR the personal life recorder mm -hmm. and yes. you know where basically you could just record everything going on around you yes. on, uh, uh, and if we can get storage class memory cheap enough and to the right density that's the sort of thing you could do where a day's activities would fit without any uh, without running out of storage. I, I think I can do that right now for my dog or my cat, actually, with the little cameras that you can attach. But I'm but afraid. But where do you put all the data? Well, yeah, I'm like, and why would you really want to look at what your cat does? All right. Well, thank you very much. You're I welcome. appreciate it.